All right. Well, we're continuing on in our series in Daniel and uh, calling it Unshakable, Thriving No Matter What Life Throws at You. Uh, we opened up with looking at the book of Daniel and we're seeing this very dramatic uh, sort of events that have happened where, where Nebuchadnezzar has invaded Israel and Daniel and his friends have been ripped out of their parents' home and their family and they're now being carted over to Babylon and it's a very uh, significant event, obviously, for these young men and uh, so we talked about how to thrive even though your world is shaken. Last week, John looked at uh, Daniel when he was forced to, uh, the pressure to conform to the wishes of the king in terms of the eating of the food and so on. And so we looked at that. And, and today we're going to be looking at more about education. And since you're age four, you enter into the education system uh, here in Ontario at least, and um, we stay in there for a good 13, 14, sometimes as many as 20 years. Uh, and uh, we never, hopefully, never stop learning. Even if we stop going to formal education, we continue to learn for the rest of our life. And the Bible has a lot to say about our education. Uh, the great commandment, of course, says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, at will heart, soul, and mind. Uh, how do you love God with your mind? Well, you love him by using your mind, by learning, by having it developed and using your mind. And that's one of the ways in which you love God, by using your mind. Uh, you've likely heard the phrase, knowledge is power, right? You've heard that before. Well, that too comes from the Bible. Proverbs 24 says, wisdom brings strength and knowledge gives power. So knowledge is what makes us stronger. It helps us uh, to continue to grow. And so the Bible actually says knowledge is power. But the kind of knowledge is important, obviously. Uh, and, and we're to guard our education, the Bible says. So another verse in Proverbs 4 says, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life kind of a strong statement. So guard it well. So are you guarding your, your education? That's an interesting question, right? Students, are you guarding your education? Parents, are you guarding the education for your students, for your children? And so how do you do that? And that's what we want to talk about today. So very quickly, the background again of Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of uh, Babylon at this time in history, and he came in to invade Israel. Uh, he destroyed Jerusalem. He brought 25% of the Israelites back with him to Babylon, uh, kept them there for 70 years where they were held captive. And some of the POWs, or the prisoners of wars, were Daniel and these three friends. And their names are Meshach, Shadrach, and... Abednego, right? We can't say Abednego anymore because John really told us off for saying Abednego. I always thought it was my shack, your shack, and a bed to go, but apparently that's not right either. But anyways, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes along and he has this indoctrination program, three years of really indoctrinating these young men into the life of Babylon, and he does it very significantly. Uh, and he says, basically, he gives them new names, he gives them new identities, he gives them uh, new values, new food, new religion, all of that. So he's stripping away everything that was them and puts into a whole new system. He says, I want you to forget about your God, I want you to forget about your Bible, I want you to forget about your values and your nationality. You are now mine. I am your God basically is what Nebuchadnezzar is doing to them. And he says in Daniel 1, verse 4 and 5, he says, Select what only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So this is a high-level education that he has given to these young men and uh, it's possible that these young men are actually excited like we don't really know what was going on in their minds but maybe they were excited because here's an opportunity for being POWs to now being in a place where they could serve in the royal palace to the man who is the most powerful man in the world at that time but the question probably was mixed with fear because they're, they're obviously in a situation where they're forced to do this and, uh, and so who is this 
uh, who is this king in this country. There was a, uh, obviously a polytheistic. Uh, they believed in many gods. Uh, the, it was a pagan education system. Uh, in fact, it, the, Eugene Peterson says in the message in verse 4 of chapter 1 that they are to indoctrinate them in the Babylonian language and the lore of magic and fortune-telling. And so there we get the sense that Babylon at that time was very superstitious. They were actually the curriculum. How would you like to have that curriculum for your teenagers? This is what they're going to be taught. And, and this is what Babylonians were. They're very suspicious or superstitious rather. And uh, their education was designed to produce psychics and fortune tellers. That's what their education was all about. So obviously there's going to be things that were contrary to what Daniel and his friends were, were, would believe at that time. But God prepared these young men for this experience. This is what it says in verse 17. It says, God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. So this is a little bit surprising, a little bit unusual, but, but th this was all part of God's plan, that God wanted them to exceed in, in, to excel in this education. And, uh, and so the challenge is that God is placing before them and before us is can you study in a pagan school and not lose your faith? And I know a lot of parents here might, might decide, for example, to homeschool their children because some of the, the fears and concerns that are there about bringing their, school, their children into the uh, public education system here, or you send them to Christian schools like Laurentian or Rockway and those kind of things. Uh, we didn't have that option when we're, our kids were growing up, but we sent them to a Catholic school for much of the similar reasons. We wanted to avoid uh, interacting with some of the secular teaching that was in other places. It wasn't a perfect place, obviously, uh, but we still wanted them to have the best chance. So here they are being placed before the Babylonian educational system that is going to expose them to multiple gods, to occultic practices, a fortune telling, and astrology, and all those kind of things. And can they weather this and still maintain their faith? This is one of the questions that we received, by the way, last, last Sunday. We, we do have a Q&A uh, spot on our church app. You can ask any questions about sermons as you go along. So it's interesting what we learn from the Babylonians from this time. There's a couple of things that, that are interesting. Like, for example, the Babylonians were really into stargazing, and they discovered the planet Jupiter without a telescope. They figured it out. And, uh, but they were also interested in the stars more for religion than they were of scientific reasons. So they were into astrology, not astronomy. There's a big difference. They're the ones that developed the zodiac signs. And so we have that uh, given to us from the Babylonians. They're also responsible. Well, I didn't know this until I found this out. I didn't know that. Of course, that's always true, right? You don't know until you find out. But uh, uh, that, that there are reasons why we have 60 seconds in a minute or 60 minutes in an hour is from the Babylonians, too. Did you know that? That's kind of interesting. Because they thought that 60 was a magical number. And that's why we have 360 degrees in a circle, because it's a factor of 60. And so we still have some of that leftovers, even to this day, from that culture uh, back then. So here we have the Babylonians giving this three-year indoctrination training program for these young men. Remember, they're only 15 years old, and they were brought before this occultic teaching that includes astrology, fortune-telling, mysticism, and all that kind of thing. And then these young men were brought back to Babylon, back to, rather, rather to Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he said he was so impressed with them. This is what it says. He found them ten times more... Uh, more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Now, so remember, they're 15, three years later, they're 18, and he's looking at these young men and saying, these guys are 10 times more capable than all the other men that are part of the advisory for the king. And so they graduate at the top of their class. That's, a, that's underestimating this, obviously. I mean, they, they are, are graduating with honors. This is major stuff. It's over the top. And they move from POWs now to being advisors to the most powerful man in the entire world at that time. So the question is, 
How do you do that? How do you, how do you learn what the world has to teach you without losing your faith? That's an important question. Because your education is only as good as what you learn, right? Uh, you can go to school all your life, but if you learn garbage, you learn things that aren't true, unscientific things and, and so on, things that are lies, are false and all that, it's not going to help you much. And, you know, when we evaluate our own education system, we're going to have varying degrees of responses, but we know that our education system is, is no longer... Uh, uh, sensitive to or built on biblical principles. Uh, a very high percentage of you in this room are teachers. I used to joke about this. If you're not sure what somebody's vocation is, just guess teacher and you'll, you'll be right most of the time. We have a lot of teachers, educators, EAs, uh, principals, in our, and retired ones as well. And so you would know more than I would uh, some of the curriculum changes that have happened over the years. I remember as a kid growing up when we would recite the Lord's Prayer. How many remember doing that Lord's Prayer every day? Yeah, many of you remember that. It was uh, 30 years ago, it was banned here in Ontario. Uh, and it would be laughable to try to think about bringing that back into our school system now. Some of you may know that the Ivy League universities in, in the States were built by uh, pastors who wanted to train pastors. So Harvard, Yale, Princeton, I think eight out of the nine Ivy League schools were actually built on a, a Christian biblical principles of teaching other pastors. That's the foundation of those universities. Even Wilfrid Laurier and Waterloo came out of the Lutheran seminary. So there's, there's that history as well. How many of you know an MB pastor who was the president of Wilfrid Laurier? Anybody know? Yeah, what's his name? Frank Peters, right? So, uh, amazing guy who was president of our school, Wilfrid Laurier School, for 11 years. And uh, so we have that, that history. We have that Christian ministry that is a part of that. But those values have dramatically changed. Christianity has been replaced by secular humanism, which in itself is a religion. And so you have, if you attend one of our schools, then you're going to get this philosophy of naturalism and materialism, that we navigate through life based upon uh, this, this human reasoning, the secular ethics, that there is no God, that there is no religion. This is the kind of ideology that is presented to us. And, uh, and so we find ourselves, uh, people being hostile even towards religion, saying that religion just distorts the truth. It's, it's, it's actually uh, like a virus. Some people would be very hostile and say things like that. And it distorts our, our true freedom and so on. And so this is the kind of ideology that our students are faced with when we enter into the school system. And if you are a believer in Christ and you're going to schools, it's very possible that your views would be uh, would be ridiculed, that your God would be mocked, that you, uh, your values would be contradicted, that your Christian perspective or worldview is no longer welcome. Uh, in fact, not only would you be seen as intolerant, but you might also be indicated as hateful because you're not going along with the values of our society. So I'm not suggesting that we don't go to our schools. I'm not suggesting that we can't learn from our schools. That's not my point. But the question is, knowing that our education is not going to be based upon biblical values, that it's going to be secular values, knowing that it's not always going to line up with our faith or our understanding of what the Bible has to say, knowing that our education is going to include some wrong teaching about very important matters like our identity and our sexuality and our meaning and purpose in life, knowing that our education is going to do all of that, how can we then go through that without losing our faith? This is what Daniel and his friends was facing. They learned a lot of things that they didn't agree with, and yet they still maintained their faith. So let me give you five things that I think are important to help us to navigate through our education and, and also even our workplace environment, because there's hostility there as well. I was talking to somebody just recently about that very issue. There's strict policies about what you, what you can and cannot do in terms of your, your, uh, your biblical values. And so how do we navigate that without losing our faith? Number one, decide in advance to stand for God. So we're going to make that decision very early on, as soon as possible, before the major tests are happening in our life, that we're going to decide that we're going to stand for God no matter what. 
We talked a couple of weeks ago that Jesus gave us this promise. It's kind of an uncomfortable promise. He's saying that you will experience difficulties, right? Paul says the same thing in, in 2 Timothy. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a promise. That's, that's a guarantee. You will experience persecution for your values. If you are trying to live a godly life, you will be experiencing this kind of harassment and difficulties in your life. So the question is, how are you going to handle that? So we, we, could, uh, we, we can respond in various ways. We can just simply ignore it or put our head in the sand or, or maybe we could even walk away from our faith, which is what some people do. Or we could stand for God, make that decision right off the bat and say, I'm standing firmly on the truth of who God is and what he says. And you can thrive in the midst of this sometimes hostile environment that we find ourselves in. This is what Daniel and his friends did. They actually excelled in their education, and they didn't let the ungodly teaching get the better of them. They took what was good and what was true, and they rejected the rest and maintained their faith. Uh, Daniel says this in in verse 8. He says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. So right from the very beginning, Daniel decided that he was not going to defile himself. He was not going to allow the Babylonian culture and their values influence him, but he was going to stand firm for God at this time. I'm going to protect my mind. I'm going to protect my heart. I'm going to protect my body. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to have these boundaries that I'm going to have, so I'm going to stand for God. How do you become a great student? In this challenging climate, the Bible says this, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And so we're starting with God. We're building on the foundation of who he is, the true knowledge that we have, and that's really the first step in knowing the truth. Standing on the true foundation. We sang about that this morning, saying the foundation of love. Uh, and so this is the, the source that we are falling on. This is, uh, you can have lots of degrees. You can have, uh, you, you've probably heard this before. Somebody might call you Dr. Fahrenheit after you get two or three more degrees, right? And uh, you can have all of this education. But the Bible says... That true knowledge is found in God. I had this, just heard just recently, uh, Bill Hall is an author and and teacher, and he was sitting beside a PhD student on the airplane, and as they were traveling, uh, flying, uh, he was impressed with how intelligent this gentleman was, but he says, if you really want to be smart, follow Jesus, and he will tell you everything that you need to know, because knowledge comes from God. In fact, God invented science. He invented math. He invented literature. He invented all of those things because all true knowledge comes from God. And when we come to the end of our life and we're asked this this question by God, he's not going to ask you, how well did you do at math when you're on earth? He's not going to ask that question. He's not going to ask you how many degrees you had. He's going to ask you, did you know me? Did you pursue knowledge of me? Because that's the source of true knowledge. So decide in advance that you're going to stand for God. Secondly, the second thing that we need to do is to never stop learning. Uh, One of the phrases that was uh, drilled into me very early on in my ministry is that leaders are learners or leaders are readers right? You've heard that before, perhaps. Leaders are readers. They're always reading. They're always learning. They're always growing. And, and this is a necessity if we are going to lead others. The moment you stop learning and growing is the moment you stop leading. And so if you're a leader, whether it's here at church in a ministry position or leading at home or leading at the workplace, uh, are you continuing to learn? Are you reading? Are you developing a skill? Are you being mentored? Is this something that is part of your your life that we need to continue to learn and, and, and be lifelong learners? Proverbs 18 verse 15 says, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. It's a, it's a great uh, two-part uh, piece to this, this verse that 
intelligent people are always ready to learn. So they're eager to learn, and their ears are open. So there's a relationship here. If you're going to learn, you need to be able to hear. You need to be able to listen. Uh, listening is one of those skills that we, all, we always overestimate our ability to listen. We're actually really bad at listening. Uh, and, and so there's books and courses about how to listen properly. And so we need to learn to listen in order to be able to grow. Uh, John Patterson, it's, John, it's pick on John Patterson Day today. And uh, he, if he came here, he would just disappear, right? Right now, the way he's dressed. And uh, that's an amazing uh, outfit he has. But John Patterson, just this past week, said to me uh, about how he had been learning over the last several years over the message. He was reflecting on the things that he had been learning in the messages on a Sunday morning. And I said to him, I said, that means you've been listening. And I didn't mean he's listening to me. I meant that he's listening to what God is saying to him through the messages. And that's really the key. I don't want you to be keen on listening to me. I want you to be keen on listening to what God is saying to you through his word and through his message. And that's really the key. I believe we can learn from anyone if we have that humble posture of listening and willing to, to hear from God. Second Timothy 2 verse 15, Paul says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and one who correctly handles the word of truth. So here God wants us to be a student. He wants us to be a student of his word, to be a student of who he is. And so, by the way, disciple is synonymous with student. If you're a disciple, you're a student of God. You're a student of Jesus, a student of the word. So you are learning to be a follower of Jesus. You're learning always to grow in your understanding of who Jesus is and to follow him. And so followers of Jesus are learners. And the uh, Bible tells us to, to, to do that, to be students and to be always learning. Thirdly, if you want to be wise in life, you want to soak yourself in God's word. Immerse yourself, drench yourself in God's word. And, and I want you to think about it in terms of this is something that takes time. It's not something that, you know, I suppose you could imagine yourself jumping in a pool of water or something like that. But I want you to think about it as something that you're sitting in a hot tub and you're just soaking. And you're just allowing that warmth to cover over you and you're just soaking in that. It's not something that you can speed through. It's something that you uh, are into as, as just allowing it to happen to you over time. You're lingering in that. This past Tuesday at the Bible study, the Sacred Rhythms uh, course that we are taking with uh, Ruth Haley Barton as the author, and um, one of the, the disciplines that we learned this Tuesday was called Lectio Divina. Uh, there's about 50 of you that are part of this class. You know what I'm talking about, Lectio Divina, which is a time of, of listening to the Word of God. You say it slowly and intentionally, and there's pauses. There's actually four movements where you're reading it four times, and there's space in between where you're silent, and you're listening for God to speak to you, and there's a word that comes, and you just reflect on that, and you allow it to ruminate in your, in your heart and mind, and allow God to, you're engaging with Him, and allowing Him to speak that and to transform you. This is not something that you can do quickly. And this was a great exercise because for me, I know my temptation is to rush through a task, to get it done, to check it off. And sometimes I can do that with scripture reading too. I've got this reading that I need to do, read it and check it off, it's done. And for when I do that, in those moments, I know it's very, uh, uh, very difficult for God to get my attention in those moments. And so God wants me to soak in his word, to listen to his voice, to listen for his direction. This is why we did the life journal. This is now almost two years that we are completing the life journal. Pastor Ingrid uh, led us through that two years ago, and that process is almost done. After two years, we should have read through the Bible, the entire Bible, but it wasn't just to check off that I've read it. The point was to linger in his word and to allow God to speak to us through that. And when we do that, our life is 
much more successful. This is what the Bible says. Listen to this in Joshua 1.8. Study the book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Isn't that amazing? This is one of the clearest promises in the Bible of success. This is how you become successful is by reading the Bible, meditating upon it, thinking about it, ruminating about it, soaking in it. And this is how we are uh, able to be successful in life. By the way, do you know how to meditate? Do you know how to meditate on, on the Bible? You, sometimes when we think about meditation, we sometimes think about Eastern mysticism where we empty our mind and those kind of things. But that's not what meditation is. Uh, how many of you know how to worry? Anybody know how to worry? There's a couple of you, the rest of you are liars. Uh, all of you know how to worry. Uh, you've done it before. I've done it before as well. And uh, sometimes we're, we're, we're doing this, this thing in our mind. We're going over and over again. And that's really the same process of meditation, although it's a lot more fun to do meditation than it is to worry. Because you're just reviewing the words. So those of you who are part of the Lectio Divina, you maybe got a word or a phrase, and we were invited to ruminate on that phrase throughout the week and just kind of keep that going in our mind. And we're meditating meditating upon that. And why is it that it is important for us to do that? Because we are faced with so much distortion in our world. There's so much lies that are out there. It's getting harder and harder to discern the truth. Have you noticed that? Uh, there are so many voices claiming to be the truth. And we have relative truth, right? This is true for me. I don't care if it's true for you or not. And, you know, this is kind of thing. And I've even heard people say that there's no absolute truth. Have you heard that before? There's no such thing as absolute truth. Do you know that that's an absurd statement? I mean, that's a self-defeating statement. Are you sure that there's no absolute truth? Yes, I'm absolutely sure. Well, how can you be absolutely sure about something that's not, there's no such thing as absolute truth? I mean, it's just a bizarre statement. And so uh, we have all of this crazy uh, statements that are out there. We have fake news. We have conspiracy theories. We have false research. We have fake degrees. We have social engineering. We have uh, bald face uh, denials and all the rest of it. And you just, you know, sometimes you, you might feel like Pilate when Jesus talked, when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Do you remember that? What is truth? And we might feel that way at times. The answer, of course, we do know the truth. It's God and his word. And if you want to discern the lies, you have to learn the truth. If you want to discern the lies, you need to learn the truth. If you're going to sort through what we are facing in our world, this confusing world, we have to know the truth. That's the only way. You know, when, when people are doing the counterfeit, uh, if they're trying to figure out what bills are counterfeits or not, they don't study the counterfeit bills. They study the brand new bills, right? You know this. They take the nice crisp $10, $20, $50, $100 bills, whatever it is, and they study every little detail of the true authentic bill so that when they see a counterfeit, they can spot it right away because they can see that it's not authentic, that it's not true. And it's the same thing, that we are to meditate on the real thing. Get to know it in every detail. One of the reasons why people are falling for, for dumb ideas this day, these days is because they're not studying the true thing. They're not seeing what is authentic. They can't see a fake. And so we need to study that which is true and a better able we are now to recognize a fake when it comes up. You're able to say, no, that's wrong. No, that's a lie. That's going to lead you down a wrong path. How do you know that? Because you've studied the truth, the real thing. Psalm 119, verse 104 says, Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Isn't that great? You know, I know, I can, I just hate the false way of life because I know it's true. I know it's beautiful. I can spot a fake a mile away. So students, if you want to be that way, this is what we need to do. And, and, and also, this next verse, if you want to be even smarter than your teachers, look at verse, uh, verse uh, 119, uh, sorry, verse 99 of Psalm 119. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. 
So I'm not going to be swayed by uh, you know, popular opinion. I'm not going to be swayed by the cultural viewpoints. I'm going to be standing firm on the truth of what God says. I read this stat recently that kind of surprised me. It kind of shook me in a little way. I understand that, that children, by the time they reach 18, will have accumulated 30,000 hours of screen time. And what that means is screen time meaning TV, video games, uh, laptop, their phone, their iPad, and, and whatever. Right, 30,000 hours that they're going to be exposed to whatever is being on that on that screen by the time they're 18. Any guesses on how long it takes to read through the entire Bible? Any ideas? 80? I think I heard 80, or maybe I just wanted to hear it because 80 is correct. <laughs> or maybe it's on the screen. That makes it a lot easier when you can see it. About 80 hours to read through the entire Bible. And my question is, how equipped are our students by their age 18 to enter into university or college where they're going to be faced with this uh, ideology of naturalism and if they haven't ever read through the Bible? That's the question that I have. How will they be able to stand up for the truth in a classroom? Proverbs says this, a wise person is hungry for knowledge while the fool feeds on trash. There's lots of trash on those screens. Not always, of course. There's always wonderful technology that used for, for positive things. Obviously, I, I totally agree with that. But sometimes there's lots of garbage that we are feeding ourselves as well. And so if you say you don't have enough time to read the Bible, you add it up. You can read through the Bible 375 times if you didn't have screen time. And so God has given us this opportunity to stand on his word and his truth. Number four. And I think this is so important, and that is we are to, be, to stay connected to other believers. I, I think that believers should be our best friends. Now, God wants us to have friends who aren't believers in order for us to rub shoulders with them, to be light to them, to share the gospel with them. But our, the people that we spend the most time with should be strong believers. Children's ministry focused last year on Psalm 1, and it said this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. So you don't want to hang out with people who are going to drag you down, that are going to lead you in a different path. You want to hang around with people who are going to grow, help you grow. So you need a life group, you need a church, you need a ministry, you need both input and output. You need to both be in a supportive uh, situation and, and where you are supporting others. You need both in and outflow in your life. And students, if you are leaving the city to go to school somewhere else, the first thing that you should be looking for is a church. A church that you can be a part of, that you can uh, to grow and also to serve and to be a part of a small group. Hebrews says this, uh, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. The reason why so many students lose their faith when they go to university is because they stop doing the things that actually help them grow in the first place. So when they stop going to church, when they stop being a part of a small group, when they stop serving, then it becomes so much more difficult to stand for the truth and to actually grow in their own life. So over the last several weeks, you've heard, and again today, uh, the we've heard people share about the importance of being a part of a life group. And we, have, we've, we push that, we talk about it regularly because it is such a key part of who we are. And, and I feel the same, exactly the same way. For me, I cannot imagine not being a part of a life group. Uh, this is not a, a, a burden. It is not something that I, that I am adding on to my life, another thing that I need to do. This is not the way I feel. We are meeting because these are my friends. These are the people that I love. These are the people that I need in my life. And so we, we meet on a regular basis. We meet weekly, and when we have a, sometimes like today, Thanksgiving Sunday, we're going to family, so we won't be meeting today. And so we miss each other for two weeks, and, and we miss each other. We really do. 
But here we are, we, we, we spend together, time together where we share what God is doing in our lives. We, we challenge each other. We go through the going deeper. Uh, we eat. We laugh. We cry. Uh, we pray for each other. We, we support each other. We're giving rides and we call each other after a difficult day. Uh, we even do vacations together. We do all of the things that spiritual friends would do with one another. Because, and why I need that is because I'm not Superman. I need that. I need others in my life to help me to live this Christian life. And so do you. We can't do life alone. We need one another. And so stay connected to your life group. And last thing, if you want to excel in your education, not lose your faith, remember that God will reward you. There's a reward that is promised to you by God. Jesus has promised us many, many times that you will receive a reward every time you've been harassed, every time you're, you've been criticized and insulted and, and, and ridiculed for your faith. And this is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He says this, God blesses, that's part of the reward, isn't it? God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. So when you are persecuting your faith, when your values are contradicting the values of, of the culture that you're in, whether it's a school or workplace or whatever, and you're being mocked and insulted and ridiculed, you then enter into the same category as Daniel and his friends, where you are being persecuted for your faith. I want to leave with you one, uh, you know, an encouraging scene of the future that I think is, is helpful for us to be reminded of. And Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2. This is a, a future scene. It says this, Therefore God elevated him, and talking about Jesus, God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Then at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you just imagine this scene where all the people who have ever lived, who have and who are ever going to live, are being placed in this position before God, and every single person is going to bow their knee and declare with their tongue that Jesus is Lord. And some of them are going to do it because they've done it all their life and there's great joy in their hearts. Yes, Jesus, you are Lord. And then there are others that are going to be there that are doing it out of judgment because they have denied it in their life. They've rejected him. And so all the people who have mocked you, all the people who have persecuted you, all the people who have insulted and, and ridiculed you, all of your professors, all of the teachers, all of the, the athletes and celebrities and politicians and world leaders and agnostics and atheists, everybody is going to bow their knee and declare that Jesus is Lord. There's no question that God is the winner in all of this. And if you're unsure about that, you need to read the Bible because it's very clear. There's no question. For now, we experience the living in a hostile culture, but God is God, and he will be declared Lord of all. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you today, we, we acknowledge that we live in a, in a challenging climate, that there is environments that are not welcoming of our values. We sometimes live in a hostile culture as well. We sense that it's coming even more. And so I don't want to lose my faith 
in my education or at my workplace, in my career. So I am deciding right now, in advance of any major test that might be coming my way, I'm declaring right now that I'm standing for you. I'm making my mind up like Daniel did to not defile myself. And help me to be re remember that reverence for you, fear for you is actually um, the way to go. It's an education in itself. So help me to never stop learning. And help me to soak in your word, to spend time regularly in your in your word, thinking and meditating about the Bible and what it has to say. And this is all part of what you want for me to be successful. And God, I want to learn the truth in order to discern the lies that are all around. And Father, I want to choose to surround myself with strong believers that will help me. So help me be, stay connected with them, connected to a church, to a, to a ministry for, for encouragement for both for myself and for others. And when I'm feeling uh, alone and when I'm feeling uh, downtrodden, I ask that you would help me be reminded of the reward that you have for me in all of eternity. So Jesus... I'm going to declare in advance, before that final moment comes, I don't have to wait until that end of history. I'm going to declare right now, Jesus, you are Lord. You are Lord. You are my Lord. You are my boss. You are my manager. You are in control of my life, and I declare that. And I want you to lead me the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.